Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Yale School of Management MBA for Executives Masterclass. My name is Keith Gallinelli. I'm the Director of Admissions here at the EMBA program. And today I'm really excited because I'm joined with a number of faculty and alumni, and we're going to have a discussion and basically an SOM classroom experience on the business of health equity. So I'm joined today by Dr. Howard Foreman, who's the Faculty Director for the uh, EMBA Healthcare Area of Focus, Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith, Faculty Director for the Posen Commonwealth Fund Fellowship, Dr. Rosanna gonzalez Calasso, Associate Director of the Fellowship, and Dr. Cece Calhoun, who is an alumni or alumnus of the program, uh, Class of 2021, and a Posen Commonwealth Fund Fellow. So thank you again for joining us today. Um, we're going to introduce both the EMBA program, the fellowship, and we're going to launch into our masterclass on the business of health equity. We're going to save some time at the end to answer your questions. So if you do have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A section on the Zoom screen. So before I turn it over to our panelists, I did want to take a few moments to discuss the structure of the EMBA program and how the fellowship works. And so if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, I always start off these presentations with the mission of the School of Management, which is to educate leaders for business and society. I think this is really important because the SOM mission is really the ideal place if you want to be a leader that seeks to make a difference in either the public sector, the private sector, and really to bring the best ideas from a variety of industries and regions together. Our faculty, our staff, our students, they really are here because the mission is meaningful to them. And our graduates, they seek to become leaders that, who help to build high functioning organizations and contribute to the broader well being of their society. And within the healthcare area, this is really, really important because the mission informs everything that we do and everything about the SOM experience. Uh, the QR code on, our, on your screen, it does point to the EMBA program webpage, and you can find information about the program, the application, which actually goes live today at 1 p.m., so in about 57 minutes, uh, the application will go live for the class of 2027. All right, and so I wanted to explain the structure of the EMBA program. The time required on campus, the first thing to understand, this is an on-campus experience. For our EMBA program, it starts off every year in July with a two-week residency, and then it goes to an every other Friday, Saturday format. We have students that are flying in from around the country. Um, many are coming from the Northeast, but uh, we have people from California, Arizona, this year, uh, Idaho and Iowa and Calgary, Texas, Florida, really all over the country. And people are coming in for this EMBA experience. In between years one and two, there is a global network week where you would have the opportunity to travel with some of your classmates, but going to one of the members of the global network for advanced management schools and do a week in another country with students from some of the top business schools around the world. Then it has another week of residency in between years one and two. That's the EMBA program. The Posen Commonwealth Fund Fellowship adds additional time and commitments on top of this. And so that starts for people that are selected as fellows, it starts off every year in June with a two day Posen immersion program. And that will repeat itself again in the second year in June. And then there are Thursday night, uh, usually Thursday nights, there's some that are Thursday for the full day, but Thursday evening, classes as part of the Posen Commonwealth Fund Fellowship. And this is where our faculty will really be dealing with the business of health equity. It's important to note those Thursdays are not every class weekend. They're about 10 times per year, five per semester. And so that's the structure of the on-campus EMBA and Posen Commonwealth Fund Fellowship. Uh, next slide, please. We do have three areas of focus within the uh, EMBA program. It's asset management, sustainability, and healthcare. And today, we're just going to highlight healthcare. We will have a number of other webinars about the entire EMBA program and all of the different areas of focus. But I wanted to highlight healthcare, of course, because this is a, a masterclass on the business of health equity. And we are joined here by Professor Howard Foreman, who is really the founding director of the EMBA program. When we were, first started a number of years ago, we only had this area of focus. Um, we've since expanded to that, but this is really kind of the, the, the bread and butter of what we do in the health equity piece. And so even for people that are not selected as Posen Commonwealth Fund Fellows, they do have the opportunity to take a deep dive into this industry, really bringing together a number of people. Yes, we do have doctors and nurses and clinicians in the program. Um, a lot of uh, the, the, the fund fellows, they are uh, people that have a clinical background, but within the area of focus, we also have people that work in hospitals, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies. We have investors and startups, entrepreneurs, all of these people that are coming together in the healthcare area of focus. 
The classes are taught not only by professors from the School of Management, but also from professors in the School of Medicine and School of Public Health. And we will be doing a number of another uh, detailed webinars about the whole program and the fellowship coming up. So just briefly about the fellowship on the next slide. This is open to healthcare professionals and leaders. They're really committed to improving healthcare access for marginalized, minoritized, medically underserved populations. The picture here is our faculty, many of who are on the call today. Actually, all of you are here on the call today. Uh, and our fellows from the class of 2025 and from the class of 2026. And so uh, hopefully we'll have some people here today that will be joining us on the picture for next year's master's class as well. Um, as we go on to the next slide, I did want to just talk about what the fellowship is. It does cover the entire cost of the MBA for executives program. It really gives practitioners, uh, clinicians, people that are working in this space, the leadership skills that they're going to need to really make an impact on their organizations. The QR code here directs you to the website on the Posen Commonwealth Fund Fellowship, where you can find a lot of the details about our, our previous fellows, about the application process, and about the work that we're doing. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our faculty who are going to launch into our master class for today. And so I'll let everyone, I think, uh, Dr. Nunez-Smith, I think you're going to be kicking it off. So I'll allow you to take over from now. Great. Thank you so much, Keith. Um, we're all really excited to be here. So we're all round robin our introductions and then get right into the course. And as Keith said, we're really eager to have time to engage with all of you in the Q&A uh, section soon. Um, so I'm Marcella Nunez-Smith, a uh, great, a deep privilege and honor to, to serve as the faculty director for the aforementioned Posen Commonwealth uh, Fund Fellowship in Health Equity Leadership. It's a mouthful. Every word is worth it. Um, I'm also a general internal medicine physician, um, faculty here at the School of Management, uh, also at the School of uh, Medicine, where I'm Associate Dean for Health Equity Research, and at the School of Public Health. Really looking forward um, to our time together today. I'll pass it over to, uh, to Dr. Howie Foreman. Thanks. Um, as Keith said, I'm Howie Foreman. I'm the uh, founding uh, director of the EMBA program and now run the healthcare track and been really fortunate to continue to be involved with the Posen Fellowship um, as well. I'm a practicing diagnostic radiologist. I run the healthcare management program in the School of Public Health and I teach health policy in the uh, School of Management, as well as in the undergraduate economics department at Yale College. And I'll turn it over to Rosanna. Thank you, Howie. My name is Rosanna Gonzalez Palazzo. I have the privilege to serve as the associate director for this beloved fellowship since 2020. I wear other hats at the medical school uh, where I'm the director of research and deputy director of DEI at the physician associate program. And also I focus or contribute to um, advancing a workforce diversity within the equity research and innovation center. And this is uh, one of the focus that we have here today. Hi, everybody. I'm Cece Calhoun. I am an assistant professor of medicine and hematology and pediatrics. I'm the medical director of our adult sickle cell program here at Yale University and have the privilege, as, as Keith mentioned, of being an alum uh, in the first class of Posen Commonwealth Fund Fellows um, under the aegis of Dr. Nunez Smith, Foreman, and Gonzalez Colasio. And I'm thrilled to support and serve this fellowship in the capacity of assistant director at this time. Great, thank you all. All right, um, uh, so we are uh, really excited to have the opportunity today to, to sort of scratch the surface, right, on the business of health equity. Um, as Keith mentioned, there are opportunities, uh, obviously for our Pose and Commonwealth Fund Fellows, but for all of our EMBA um, healthcare students and beyond to really roll up your sleeves on this topic during your time uh, in the EMBA at SOM. So, um, so with all the reality that we cover this in a um, in a full course and beyond. And so we're not gonna go deep on everything, but we definitely wanna give this overview and a chance to, um, to maybe sort of inspire some questions and curiosity around the business of health equity. 
$320 billion is a big number, right? This is uh, some of our best estimate really for what the financial costs are in our healthcare system specifically from health inequities. Uh, but to state the obvious, there are many costs to these persistent entrenched um, health disparities and healthcare disparities. And we're gonna talk about how those are related, what those differences are, right? And um, I often say it's it's helpful, particularly when we start talking about inequities, to think about uh, sort of a pie, right? And that, that pie, if we think about what parts and proportions result and contribute to health inequities, we'll see that maybe 10 to 20% of that variance is due to health care, right? Health care inequities. That's once you have walked into a healthcare facility that there are variations um, in quality, variations in experience of care and other things that lead to disparate outcomes by perhaps race, ethnicity, gender, insurance status, um, zip code, and other demographic characteristics. So 10 to 20%, which our medical students often are very surprised to learn. Um, and what we're gonna go deep on today are these health-related social needs. And that's about 60 to 80% of that pie and that variant. So those are things like having access to nutritious food, um, quality, stable housing, uh, transportation, you know, educational economic opportunities. So what people here may have heard us, and we'll talk about today, these different terms, sort of social structural determinants or drivers of health or health related social needs. So in our time today, we're gonna highlight a few of the pressing health equity challenges and opportunities. Um, we know that we, the four of us uh, who are panelists, are part of a larger community with all of you thinking through opportunities. What's exciting about this field is that when I was a medical school um, student, we barely had this language. We were starting to understand disparities. So this is a field where it's not just about being a passive learner, but being an active participant and change maker. Next slide. So I'm going to kick us off with an overview um, where we are right now in terms of the health equity landscape and innovations. Going to use COVID-19 as a bit of a use case for us to, um, to show that when we are um, motivated and unified and united in goal, we can achieve um, equity. And then we'll be passing it along to the other panelists, Drs. Uh, Foreman and Gonzalez Colasso will dive into those specific health equity challenges and opportunities, talking about the payment policy landscape and shifting workforce dynamics uh, in particular. Before handing it off to Dr. Calhoun, who's gonna share techniques to help clarify the value proposition. And then it's your turn uh, to engage with, uh, with all of the panelists uh, in Q&A. Next slide. All right, so this is exploding um, out of it. So uh, again, to keep up with the language, the social, structural, health determinants, health drivers as they were, um, or often when we're talking about the contribution to healthcare, the health-related social needs, right? However we umbrella them, these are often summarized as just basic needs for individuals. Um, and in the US, this is nomenclature we use, if we look at our global um, peers, often people will talk about a social safety net and what that brings. Uh, I think everyone who's joining us today will be very familiar with our dubious distinction in the U.S. of spending really much more on health care and health care delivery than all of our peer nations. And that's what's shown in that graphic um, on the left. And on the right are just some of those highlight headlines that we often see um, where we're sort of wringing our hands, why are we spending so much and yet getting uh, less often. And obviously the focus of our conversation today, we're spending so much more on health care expenditures than our peer nations. Uh, we also have a very dubious distinction when it comes to issues of inequities um, by, uh, by social class status uh, and race. I think what maybe uh, might be newer or a different way to think about this conundrum uh, is for us to think about what we invest in healthcare and what we invest in social care. And we could really have a graphic here that is the reverse of what you see, where we would unfortunately in our country be on the trailing end of investments in social care or our social safety net. 
Um, and when you actually combine together, and this is work done featured here, the American Healthcare Paradox by good colleagues and friends of all of us on the panel, uh, Dr. Bradley and Taylor, that really say, perhaps we've been asking the wrong question, right? If we frame this conversation, of what is our ROI when we think about our investments and expenditures in health um, and health care and also in social care. Uh, and that I think is a real area ripe for policy. We'll talk more about this. When you see that investment in both healthcare dollars and social care dollars, that is where other peer nations are really gonna um, leapfrog us and get those better health outcomes. So our question to interrogate is how do we think about social care in this country? How do we think about funding social care? How do we think about social care as in fact health related cost? Next. Uh, so unfortunately we could pick many different topics. Uh, for right now, we're gonna highlight um, maternal mortality. This is a topic that is frequently uh, in the news. I'm grateful for it to be getting additional um, coverage. When we think about this through the lens of, uh, of race, and so oftentimes when I speak of health equity, I'll begin with thinking about race and place uh, within the US context. Um, again, students and trainees are often really surprised not to just learn where we are with maternal death rates in this country, which are uh, quite high. Again, this global peer nation comparison, we do not fare well. Um, you can see in that graph on the left that when we start uh, disaggregating our data, really important to do and asking health equity questions, that we begin to see racial disparities emerge. Moreover, right, when we think about the intersections of um, uh, race with other factors that we sometimes consider protective, like educational attainment, um, these disparities do not dissipate. Uh, and so oftentimes it is staggering for, for, um, for people to learn that in our country, Black women who have been college educated or more still have a higher rate of maternal mortality compared to, for example, um, white peers, uh, birthing people who have not achieved a high school education. So really some complex questions to start unpacking um, and lots of opportunities for us to think about solutions. Um, again, on the right, I would lift up that place question there. One of those highlights, rural hospitals, people may be tracking what's happening in terms of rural hospitals and their ability or, or lack thereof to provide uh, maternal labor and delivery service and care. So always these intersections besides the business case, the fiscal realities, the payment landscape um, and inequities. Next slide. So a little bit of alluding to this, this is pulled from an article written by Lauren Taylor, again, one of the co-authors of the American uh, Healthcare Paradox. Uh, on the left right now, this graphic is, uh, or schematic, is sort of our present day state. Um, we have healthcare very much at the center when we think about health, uh, back to that you know big sort of pie and all the things that are part of health. Uh, we center healthcare and healthcare delivery and healthcare systems. Um, and so maybe, you know, I would say that there's some, um, uh, some of these are more dotted than others for most uh, healthcare ecosystems. There'd be a dotted line to something like housing and maybe a more solid line to rehab centers and, and home health. But this whole universe of uh, often referred to as ancillary services or other um, really entities that are starting to think about those health related social needs kind of on the periphery with healthcare holding those uh, the bulk of the resources there and thinking about how to disperse them. Um, but on the right, really, that's our question. Uh, you know, is, is that serving our purpose? Are we getting to goal? Um, how do we think about funds flow? Because really, essentially, this is that that model. Uh, I often say that we have many partners outside of the healthcare system proper, such as community-based organizations and others that are really expert in addressing um, the health-related social needs that expertise doesn't necessarily live within healthcare systems. So how do we begin to shift our thinking uh, to make sure that we um, are investing in all the components we know are gonna result in better health for everyone? Next slide. So just a couple minutes on the COVID-19 use case, uh, because I think this was a moment for us as a nation uh, where we had a collective witnessing. Um, I, I often say that, um, that now I find myself on sort of this side of the pandemic in spaces where 
uh, as this one, where we don't begin with definitions of health equity or health inequity, um, that most people have uh, some at least basic understanding of what the challenges are. And that's in part due to what we saw with COVID-19 and who, which communities were disproportionately affected, affected earliest, affected um, uh, um, most substantially, and of course, are continuing to try to recover on many different fronts. I had the great opportunity uh, and honor to be part of our national, both here in the state response to COVID-19, but also nationally working with the incoming uh, Biden-Harris administration and then with the administration, thinking on multiple different levels about how to center equity in our national response to COVID-19. Um, doing the transition there in the bottom left, the schematic around the national strategy for the COVID-19 response and pandemic preparedness. At the time, there wasn't a national strategy in place. One of many, many people who had the opportunity to work on that strategy. And in there, we have goal six, which was very specific about thinking about race and place-based disparities in COVID-19. Um, but the reality is the response to COVID-19 federally and in many, many states and local jurisdictions really brings to light what we've known, right, for decades. Health equity as a field and discipline is not new. There are researchers whose entire careers have been built on this. The knowledge and evidence base is there. Unfortunately for many of them, it came at professional consequence because of skepticism and disbelief. Um, but there is a science to health equity that we could lean on in that COVID-19 response that brings to bear that knowledge that we have to think about healthcare delivery, but also about those health-related social needs and drivers. Uh, next slide. So we were charged, right, in COVID-19 to vaccinate an entire country. And from the president and vice president to do that with equity at the center. We did it as a country. We did this. Right? In September of 2021, for the first time nationally, we achieved vaccination parity by race ethnicity for all adults over 18 in this country. This is really important, right? The what, that we could achieve it. So often in this space, again, people are like, oh, the boulder is too large and the hill is too steep. We cannot ever advance or achieve health equity. Yes, we can. The how here is critically important, right? And so through these multi-sectoral partnerships, again, who is expert in what? What can healthcare systems do? What does industry do, private sector? What can they bring to the table? Community-based organizations, grassroots organizations and others all coming together, bringing their expertise to the table in a unified, united way, rowing in the same direction, we can get it done. So I want people to hold this as a use case too when we think about really complex, wicked, challenging problems in health equity to know that we can in fact do this. And a lot of this has to do with policy levers and how you um, pull them as well. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. I won't read each of these for time. Happy to discuss more in the Q&A. These are just what I sort of call our health equity fundamentals. Whenever we identify that there is a disparity or inequity, oftentimes the conversation does need to begin with access, access to whatever the service or resources that we're discussing with the national response to COVID-19. Prioritizing access was really important, doing that in a systematic way. For our work, we use the Social Vulnerability Index that will be familiar to, uh, to folks here, thinking about area-based measures. Um, we'll come back to this theme of just how important data is, uh, what data we collect, who collects it, who gets to have governance and authority over it. Um, but our data infrastructure and architecture reflects our values. If it's invisible in the data, then we're never going to be able to not just see and baseline but interrogate and intervene. So oftentimes we begin with access, making sure in this case, this was about um, making sure there was access to uh, vaccination venues and opportunities. And also thinking about policy, I'll just lift up that second bullet, You know, getting a health equity lead as part of the funding tied to vaccination within each jurisdiction, really difference making. But then addressing those structural barriers, right? Everything that we've been articulating, making sure that we were engaging with stakeholders who could bring to us and say, there are problems with childcare, there are problems with transportation and transit. And not just pulling federal levels, but also industry, we'll come back to private sector too, important um, in solution finding. 
And then last is around trust, right? This is a conversation we need to have and have explicitly. Um, here, the context was increasing vaccine and vaccination confidence, but we have to be able to speak truth about you know, the systems, um, centuries that I always say it's with intentionality that we got to a place of these health inequities, only with uh, intentionality are we gonna be able to reverse um, and correct. Next slide. So really very briefly, mostly as a resource for folks, um, in addition to serving as a senior advisor to the White House response, also chaired the presidential task force on COVID-19 um, health equity. Uh, these are all publicly available documents, not just our recommendations and our top five, uh, our five top lines are, are here, um, which do speak to things like having community voice elevated, working in partnership, thinking about our data ecosystem um, and other key needs for now and for future. But also there's a roadmap, right? We provided an implementation guide and accountability framework as well. Perhaps one of the deepest compliments is when folks outside of government, um, either local or, or state or federal call, we've had several industry partners call to say they're using this as a resource for them. So everyone, and uh, you know, this is everyone's work. Um, health equity is a team sport. Uh, we need all sectors, all individuals doing their part. Next slide. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up really soon and pass it along. Uh, but here's just one thing, just one example, I, I think that kind of brings some of these ideas together. This is an initiative out of the office of the director at NIH. Uh, um, uh, I do direct equity research and innovation center based at the School of Medicine. Uh, we're a community of health equity researchers um, working primarily on NIH funded projects. Um, this Compass Initiative, really aligns with a lot of what um, came out of our task force and what has come out of, again, generations of science and health equity. Community leadership, those groups that are most affected, being able to set the course for intervention and remedy. Um, so Compass is based around intervention. Uh, you know, I remember General Petraeus said, we have to stop admiring the problem. I feel like that's where we have been in health equity and really move towards these interventions, solutions, policy changes. Um, and so this initiative, I think, holds quite a bit of promise. We're excited at ERIC um, to, uh, to have been able to compete, to be one of the health equity research hubs, again, in service to these community-led uh, initiatives that are across the country country. We're really hopeful uh, to be funded, reviewed very well, but keep our eye on things like Compass and other initiatives. Next slide. Um, and these are some of those other initiatives to keep our eyes on, right? So CMS, folks will know that's our larger payer, that's Medicaid, Medicare, uh, ha really have been um, making us in healthcare take notice of the rest of that pie, right? That 60%. How do we think about uh, reimbursing hospitals or penalizing hospitals for all cause readmission? When you think about a time span of 30 days, you have to start thinking about where are we discharging those patients to? Uh, what is their health services and access like outside the hospital? Um, CMS has released a health equity framework. I would encourage everyone to pay attention to that. There's a lot of innovation and movement in the Medicaid um, 1115 waiver space. You've seen a lot of communities think about Medicaid dollars for things like housing. Um, we've seen healthcare systems that are usually uh, in a competitive stance unite to provide and build housing. So really watch this space. Next slide. All right. And with that, um, a lot of passion and excitement. I could go on for weeks uh, on this topic, but I'm going to pass it over to first Dr. Foreman and then to Dr. Gonzalez Colasso to lift up some specific health equity challenges and opportunities for us today. Howie. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to sort of leverage on the, the point that Dr. Nunez-Smith was just making about um, Medicaid and the financing of our system to, to sort of introduce one particular lens that I emphasize in my teaching at all levels, and that is that in many ways, there are a lot of um, you know, a lot of incentives that are already existing in our system that work against health equity. And this is not to say that the financing of our system is the only problem with health equity. Uh, it is absolutely not, but it is a key one and it's one to keep in mind. Um, and I wanna just speak to that on a few different levels. And, and first of all, I think one thing I could tell you is that when I give the longer version of this talk, which is about an hour long talk, um, I always start off by reminding people that this may seem crass in the way that I talk about it, because whenever you're talking about 
just the financing of healthcare. It can seem a little crass. And I just want to put that aside and make sure that you're aware of the fact that I'm, I'm aware of that. I just want to get the points across and hope that these will be meaningful to you. Our system really is still built around generating volume, treating low acuity patients who are commercially insured and typically young. Like that is how you make money in American medicine generally. It, there's, it's not that there aren't some exceptions, but in general, that is how it works. If you're an orthopedic surgeon or a primary care doctor or a hospital, what you really want to do is find people who have employer-based insurance, typically commercially commercial insurance. You want to find younger people. That's why they're, they, they, have, they have an employer. They're able to work. It very often means that they don't have disabilities or at least have a much lower likelihood of disabilities in chronic conditions. And so, for, so therefore, they are lower acuity. Uh, and that is a big intersection with commercially insured. And then you want to see a lot of them. That's how you make money in American medicine. And again, we could spend time talking about how some models out there, including City Block and uh, those by the large insurance companies, whether it's through Centerwell or Optum, are trying to upend that model. But that is the model in general if you want to make money. Um, and we all, those of us that are practicing clinicians, we all to some degree for, uh, become subservient to this model. When people tell me that they've got a great private practice job that pays really well. I know what that means. That doesn't typically mean that it's run so efficiently and for the benefit of patients that people make more money. It typically means that they're working in a richer, uh, more educated market with commercial insurance, younger, lower disabilities. Uh, to look at it in reverse, and again, this is the crass point, whether you are a hospital or an outpatient provider, you have every incentive to avoid disabled patients, non-English speaking patients, patients with multiple comorbidities, Medicaid patients or uninsured patients, and including elderly patients for the most part. And uh, I will make a, um, a brief plug for the podcast that Harlan Krumholtz and I uh, co-host, but it gave me the opportunity about a year or two ago to interview one of um, Dr. Nunez Smith's colleagues and, and one of my former medical students, uh, Tara Lagu, uh, who's now in Chicago. And she does a lot of uh, health equity and healthcare work around disabilities. And she had published several papers in health affairs uh, a couple of years ago, and that's why we had her on the podcast. And it reminded me just how stark this is, that if you are a disabled patient and you go and try to make an appointment at an office, there are frequently times that they will say, we can't see you, or we don't have a ramp because we're a pre-ADA building, or we have a ramp, but we don't have somebody who can meet you in the parking lot and help escort you up. So I hope you're bringing an aid with you. Um, all sorts of impediments to how people can get health care. And so I will give you, I'll just remind you, health equity is a very expansive term, as Keith and Marcella said early on. It's not just about race. It is about all marginalized and minoritized populations and the disabled population, and particularly disabled populations that don't speak English, are absolutely several rungs away from getting adequate care in our country. And let me also say that while I can blame the system, and that's the easiest part, and I do think it's the, the biggest part, it is also us uh, as practitioners who go out and seek higher compensation jobs. Those jobs then go out there and try to figure out how do we make sure that we can pay people a competitive wage. Once they go out and do that, they start to realize that if you're going to build a new facility, if you're going to expand your practice, you want to be able to do that in the suburbs. You want to do that in areas where maybe buses don't even go. Uh, you want to be able to do that where somebody can walk up a flight of steps rather than not, uh, and so on. So, and then on top of that, let me just say that even though I do think the Medicare Advantage plans and the insurance companies that run them have tried very hard 
to create incentives for taking care of high comorbidity, complex patients, try to reduce health, health, uh, health disequities. Um, they're also complicit in this as well, because it is their greatest incentive to upcode, to basically make sure they maximize the acuity rating of a patient to such a degree that they capture as much revenue as possible. Now, legally, that's fine. Uh, there's recently an article, I think, in Stat News and a few other places where United Health Group is doing everything they can to uh, screen patients for um, coronary artery disease, for instance. There are others that are trying to screen for early signs of heart failure. Obviously, screening people for early signs of renal failure would be great. But when you're doing that mostly to upcode, mostly to capture more revenue, it undermines the general idea, which is that we should be doing those things in order to improve health and health care for everybody. So I, I give you a few points on the right just to think about. We can count on the benevolence of providers to accept compensation below the market, but this only goes so far. So for instance, if you look out there at our uh, community health centers, what we used to refer to as federally qualified community health centers, you know, they are doing um, incredible work, very often, if not always, being paid less than what a market wage might otherwise give them. Uh, they are providing care to populations that are otherwise, uh, again, marginalized, minoritized, and under-resourced in many different ways. Um, you can count on that. You can count on people being good and decent, but you can't count on that forever. It's not, it, it certainly won't cover the entire population. Another alternative is to accept that there are two tiers and that in the best of all worlds, the, the lower tier will still deliver really acceptable good care. It might not have the bells and whistles. It may not treat people as well in certain ways. They may wait a little longer, but at least outcomes might be comparable. And I always like to believe at least that in New York City, the Health and Hospitals Corporation exemplifies that model. If you're a poor individual, you don't get taken care of at Langone Medical Center. You're, you're shuffled off a block away to Bellevue Medical Center where you're going to get excellent care, but it's not Langone. Um, and there are people that will accept these as alternatives for those populations, and they can mitigate health disequities, but they are not truly equitable, not in, in any possible way that one can imagine. Um, and the last is really that we can move toward payments that actually match need rather than match endowment that we should be thinking more broadly about how do we deliver the care to people who need it rather than deliver the care to people who have the money to pay for it or the resources to pay even more than what it costs. Some people think of this as just being single payer, but single payer alone probably wouldn't solve all the issues because you really need single payer with an emphasis on appropriately funding the most challenging populations. Single payer that doesn't correct for the fact that a non-English speaking disabled individual who comes with an aid to your office is still going to take considerably more time to care for than a young, healthy adult who hops up on the exam table and is able to quickly tell you exactly why they're there. And so you have to think about not just simple ideas like what does single payer mean, but really think about how do we deliver the appropriate care at a population level and an individual level that is sustainable economically, financially, and that will deliver um, equal value and equal care for all so that we reduce these disequities. I'll pause there so that we can have time for questions at the end and turn it on to Dr. Rosanna Colasso. Thank you, Howie. Uh, clearly, you brought us uh, many factors in terms of uh, affordability, access that influence care and outcomes, creating challenges um, to make the task of eliminating health disparities and achieving health equity challenging. And I like to present the challenging the challenge of lack of diversity in the healthcare system. Um, uh, healthcare, the healthcare workforce is not keeping pace with the changing demographics and diversity of the U.S. population, and um, that is evident uh, when having 
when the lack of a diverse uh, uh, or the, the need of a diverse workforce is critical to maximizing care of underserved patients, like the ones that you mentioned, those who have limited English proficiency, those who are socially and economically disadvantaged, those who live in distant rural areas, and also those who are uh, representing um, growing uh, groups uh, racially and ethnically in the country. So um, as I mentioned before, I am involved not only in this fellowship, but in education, uh, in education in a medical school that serves, uh, trains multiple types of trainees. And uh, currently approximately 9% of the physician workforce identified as non-Hispanic Black, American Indians, and Alaskan Natives and Hispanic. So who are, there are many more, more many more of those populations to be served. Uh, particularly in uh, the physician workforce, despite comprising 13% of the nation's population, non-Hispanic Blacks account for only 4% of the physician workforce. But that is the same in the physician associate workforce, which is 3%. Additionally, there is gender gaps in the workforce for members of minority racial and ethnic groups, such as 52% of younger physicians less than 29 years of age are women. Uh, um, and this gap in diversity is not unique to the physician or physician assistant workforce, but additional challenges are to, to build and uh, retain diversity across the interprofessional healthcare system, including in the nursing workforce, social workers, life professionals, and leadership. We do have a leaky pipeline into the health professions, and the cost of education is one of the root causes of uh, such situation. And we also have low representation of underrepresented minority faculty, where only percent of uh, uh, only four percent of the faculty members in medical schools in the United States are, re are represented in uh, by those racial and ethnic groups. So we have a challenge here with the composition of the workforce and leading health equity work to serve uh, the most vulnerable populations without diversity and uh, in the workforce and leadership is difficult. There are organizational structures uh, with uh, hierarchies and power dynamics uh, that makes difficult to have transparent and effective conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And most recently, um, over the several, last several years, state lawmaker, lawmakers and governors in a number of states, to 19, have introduced legislation and or official correspondence that may limit health equity work, including restrictions on the ability to state-funded institutions to support DEI practices and in initiatives, which will make um, the work of diversifying the healthcare landscape difficult. In addition, the healthcare industry is not a stranger to the phenomenon of the great resignations. Uh, since 2020, 18% of healthcare work workers have quit their jobs, with many surveys indicating that 20 to 50% of physicians and nurses stating they are ready to quit in the next year. Despite these barriers, many leaders in education, health systems, government and professional organizations, community organizations are compelled to combine their networks to uh, find solutions and diversify the healthcare workforce. Uh, in our uh, program, we are compelled to make clear arguments about why uh, we need to do that and what would be the value. Uh, definitely, uh, we talk about diversity uh, will increase access to care by serving minority and socioeconomically disadvantaged populations like the one that Dr. Foreman was talking about. Diversity will increase the use of healthcare and improve adherence by providing better opportunities for minority patients to see providers um, who um, understand their needs and preferences. preferences. Diversity will increase the propensity to use healthcare through greater trust in the healthcare delivery system. And diversity will improve health outcomes through better leadership and advocacy for policies and programs uh, to serve vulnerable populations. So that is uh, the opportunity that we have and what we 
can do and we need to do is to secure leadership buy-in uh, to ensure that the leaders prioritize diversity as a means to uh, improving health equity because they understand the connection between equity, quality, safety, cost, and value. Developing strategies and plans and structures for recruitment and retention, which not starts only in attracting people to medical school, PA schools, or nursing schools, but it starts much earlier in um, creating pipeline programs in high schools than even before. And um, other um, strategies is to collect good data and monitor performance. And when we attract diverse healthcare providers, whether they, uh, our attrition in education is um, not the culprit that uh, people cannot do it with adequate support. Everyone can have a superb education to serve and uh, graduate and serve communities and advance healthcare. And lastly, developing interventions to address this um, lack of diversity in uh, schools and lack of diversities in leadership and lack of uh, support for such diversity. With this, I'm going to pass the baton to Sisi Calhoun uh, to speak about the value proposition uh, for health equity. Uh, thank you. So we, we see the problem. We know that health inequities are costing us 320 billion. And we know that we are not incentivized to mitigate these. Our systems do not incentivize, uh, incentivize us. But the case that Dr. Nia Smith shared with us shows us that we can do it. We did learn through COVID that when we are intentional and aligned that we can have success. So the question that we need to ask ourselves as leaders is how do we move this forward? How do we continue the work that's already been done to make effective change in our organizations? I think these, this is the question that we ask ourselves um, not just as leaders every day, but something we really focused on, um, I did as a student uh, at, at SOM, and thinking about by nature, all of us on this call, I mean, all of us as the attendees and panelists are in positions of power. And so how do we think about creating that value prop proposition, defining and articulating that for our colleagues to be agents of change within our organization? You know, we often think about the mission and vision where we're in vision, we're mission driven organizations, but we know that that does not always align with the fiscal priorities. You know, uh, colloquially speaking, we often say there's no mission without margin, right? And so how do we align those things in a way that is not just clear, but compelling to the to our communities and around us? And so I would encourage all of you all who are already in organizations who may have already started these practices to look at the data that you have. How is this working to add value to your organization? Identify those initiatives very concretely that are working to move forward. Then think about outcomes. Are we doing what we said we are going to do within our priorities and fiscal priorities? We said we wanna do this, are we doing that? Are the, is this relevant to our organization? And how do we continue to lift up those, those efforts? Dr. Nia Smith mentioned CMS. And for those of us who are in healthcare systems, we know the Joint Commission and other regulatory bodies are really lifting up health equity as an opportunity for us to continue to move the field forward. And I want to understand, want to emphasize and understand as we talked about this and a few of our, and some of our professors here, Heidi Brooks, talk about change. You know, we know that it's slow, but we know that it's persistent. And one of my favorite quotes from Frederick Douglass is that we have to, it happens when we agitate, agitate, agitate. And so as we're thinking about our values, the nexus of values and value we know that we're in a position to continue to move the field forward. And so as we go through the scope of information, which we tried to cover in 50 minutes, which is just not enough time, you all, which is why we have a whole program. One of the things I think is most impactful and meaningful in examining these questions in the business school setting is being able to leverage the knowledge that we have as health equity leaders and understanding how to 
to disseminate that information to maybe an audience that's not engaged, that wants to call it something else. But we know the work doesn't stop. And so how do we define, define that context? And so I want to leave some time for questions and answers. Hopefully we can get to some of your thoughts there. And so I'd like to have um, it go back to our director, Dr. Nunez Smith, for a few thoughts. Thank you. Uh, you know, really underscore. Just it's it's a it's a sampling, really. I mean, there's a lot to cover in this field. We do need the best minds. Um, uh, we're really grateful because it is we are a community of co learners um, and and change makers, right? And doers. Uh, the skill set that that is provided at Yale SOM is key. I mean, I think back to how we envisioned this this fellowship, and I've been fortunate to be invited to be part of um, of making this real. Uh, but the compelling case that how we provided, you know, all those years ago as we were starting this, is still true. Like people need the skills from an MBA, right? And Yale SOM, um, given its commitment to business and society, the exact right place. I mean, this bringing together that knowledge along with the deeper dive on, on health equity is the unique offering here at Yale. Um, there really wasn't enough time, right? As Dr. Calhoun said, uh, but there are a couple of takeaways. You know, we really, um, we, we can do this thinking about that whole pie, thinking about health related social needs and the healthcare delivery system. Specifically, it's not a or, we have to do both. Um, sometimes with health equity, it can really feel overwhelming. We wanna leave you with that sense of opportunity. There is great movement afoot. Uh, and there is, I, I think, a, a window here for us to really lean into as we think about payment, um, workforce, uh, and everything else. That value proposition that we're ended with, it's going to be key. It's going to carry you forward, right? It's, it is that uh, culmination of bringing together health equity expertise um, and the expertise from the MBA. How do you put this value and values conversation um, together and really not just speak to what, but also um, the how. So we really thank you again for joining us today. I'm gonna to turn it back to Keith and hopefully we do have some time for some of your questions. Sorry, I had to find my unmute button, um, but thank you very much. That was fantastic. Um, we do have the questions open. Um, we do have one submitted, but I think um, I give people a few more minutes if they would like to submit some questions. Um, maybe Savannah, if you wouldn't mind bringing the slides up for just a second, I will go, kind of go over some of the next steps as the questions come in and then we'll get to those, those questions. Um, so one thing I just don't, wanted to point out is that if you are thinking of applying, the application, as I mentioned, is going to be open officially in seven minutes for the uh, class of 2027 uh, uh, today. Um, I put out the round deadlines. We have three rounds of application. They're all independent of one another. Sometimes people ask me, do I have to apply in round one and then go to round two and then go to round three? No, they're independent of one another. So if, for example, you were applying in round one, the application deadline is on October 28th. Uh, we will have interviews on November 22nd and 23rd in person on campus. Um, some of the POSEN interviews may be uh, remote just because we have faculty that are in different parts of the country. And then we released the EMBA decisions in early December for round one. Uh, the POSEN Commonwealth Fund Fellowship often has maybe a little bit longer timeline for the decision and the selection of the fellows, but it is very important. I strongly recommend getting your application in in either round one or round two. Um, a few things I did want to highlight on the application itself. Um, we do have two short EMBA essays to talk about a little bit about your thought process of why do you want to do an MBA at this point in your life and career and why in particular Yale. And there are two specific questions uh, about the Posen Commonwealth uh, Fund Fellowship. And maybe Howie, you mentioned this a little bit when we were talking before. Um, do you want to just say a few words about kind of how people should approach even the, the answering of those essay questions for the fellowship? Yeah, I just want to point that I think everybody would, would agree with me. You know, we have a fantastic healthcare EMBA program and those essays we've been receiving for over 15 years. But to be really competitive for the Posen Fellowship in particular, it is important that you have demonstrated in the past an ongoing interest in health equity specifically. Um, we would love to reach a point where we could be accepting people who are wanting to pivot into health equity, uh, but at the current time and in, in accordance with the funders, we are trying to accelerate the careers of people who already have demonstrated 
early leadership or even, even greater than that leadership in health equity and help them accelerate and catalyze their careers and hopefully help nationally uh, and globally reduce health, equ health disequities. Excellent. Thank you very much. And the one other thing I just wanted to mention, this sometimes gives people pause, um, is that we do require an exam from, from all. So regardless of your experience or your background, we accept the GMAT, the GRE. And if you haven't taken any of those in the last five years, I strongly recommend the EA exam. It's the executive assessment. It's done by the same folks that do the GMAT, but it's geared towards working professionals. It's a little bit shorter. Um, it takes a little bit less to prepare for, but it really does give us uh, the information uh, for people to make sure that they're ready to jump into a really rigorous MBA program. It is a quantitative program, and we want to make sure that people are ready. Um, so with that, I think let's go over our questions. We had a few coming in. How does this program support folks who are already working within health equity complete the program, especially from less represented communities? Great. Thanks for the question. And so, you know, I will, I would maybe um, with, without the ability to sort of further clarify what underscore what Howie said, right? This is Health Equity 3.0. So we are most certainly within the fellowship program looking for exactly that phenotype of person who is already working uh, in this field and making, you know, making change and difference already for everybody, and Keith will say this too, you know, the next step after this, if you haven't already, is to be in touch with Keith and the team. Um, one of the great privileges within our fellowship program, um, you know, three fellows per year, and within the, M the EMBA, right? This is intimate, this is a family, we see each individual here. So your specific questions, bring those forward to the admissions team, um, and we'll sort of, we'll, we'll be able to problem solve, right, around whatever those issues are that are unique and, and potentially um, uh, like barriers, right, for us to to figure out a path forward if there's interest and fit. But thank you for the question. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next question, uh, wanted to know, what, what about addressing some of the administrative burdens to the healthcare system like prior authorization? Uh, couldn't that free up more money to address health inequities? So, so I'll just briefly just say that nothing that we're talking about doesn't suggest that there are a lot of things we could do better in healthcare writ large. There's a lot of efficiency gains that can be had for a host of reasons. Obviously, there are reasons why single payer may be more, um, certainly more equitable and may be more efficient for certain things and other models could also be more efficient. We're, we're specifically addressing uh, in, this, in this webinar, at least, the health equity specific concerns. Um, and I have no doubt that if we wanted to put more money into the system, we could find money a lot of ways, not just saving from efficiency gains. We could also be allocating appropriate amounts of money to healthcare for individuals that have need. Thank you. And we have, you wanted to know if you could give a snippet regarding how the graduates of the EMBA program have gone on to work in the health equity space uh, post-graduation. Dr. Calhoun, do you want to Happy to, and I, uh, if we have time, I'm happy to comment on the other questions as well. So um, one thing I will say is it's not just that you're coming as an individual, but you're developing a community of people who already have an alliance, shared um, vision and goals. And so even when I think about my own uh, classmates, one of whom is um, Director for Health and Human Services for the City of Philadelphia, uh, other classmate who is an executive leader um, in um, California, um, and, and other uh, classmates who are really doing dynamic work, work in four foundations, um, community-based organizations. It is a broad community, um, and I would encourage you to take a look at our website. I, uh, SOM does like to brag on us, uh, so there is some more detail if you're interested in who's doing what, um, but these are friends and colleagues that are on a journey with you, and so when Enrique was asking the question about about uh, supporting people who are already in equity. And when um, Dr. Whitaker put forth a, a, um, a suggestion for improvement, these are kind of the engagements and discussions and questions that we ask one another and that we work together to find solutions for. Um, Keith mentioned earlier about Thursday night sessions as a time point, but I wanna emphasize it's actually a unique opportunity to get really intimate and close space with healthcare leaders. And so that is time that is high, high, high value. And where we can support one another, ask these questions, and then continue to support each other in our, in our journeys forward. Great, thank you. We're almost coming up to time, but I do wanna maybe finish with one other question about the assault on DEI programs and how any recommendations for that. I think that's an important question as well. 
Well, definitely we are seeing the impact of that, not only um, close to us uh, with individuals that have former roles that had been uh, kind of had to move to other organizations in order to do that type of work. But even in states where uh, the legislation is favorable, we are seeing community resistance in the uh, advancement of uh, DEI. So I think we are entering a space of uh, discourse around these uh, words, and uh, we will need to find ways to say it, to communicate it in compelling and persuasive ways, as our director always teaches us, because we need to be heard. And maybe we do not need to use, we need to move away from the uh, DEI uh, acronym, which is causing visceral reactions in some individuals. So I think uh, it's going, we are going to see many changes, especially during the next few months. Excellent, thank you very much. Savannah, would you bring up the last slide? I do wanna wrap things up here. There are a few other questions out there, but definitely please feel free to reach out directly to me, uh, my admissions team at emba.admissions at yale.edu. Uh, but I just wanted to talk about some of the next steps, um, things that you could you can do. Um, Basically, we'd love to have you come on campus for an information session. The first one will be this Saturday on uh, August 17th. And then we have a number of them coming up over the next few uh, weeks throughout the fall and uh, in the spring as well. These are great opportunities because not only are you going to have a chance to meet the admissions team, but we always host these during a class weekend. So you have the, uh, the, the opportunity to meet our current students, to meet their current fellows, as well as professors, go to a class in the afternoon. So please definitely feel free to, to come to one of our events. I'll put the, the link up there and we'll also send a follow-up email after this session. If you haven't done so already, we have the opportunity for you to complete, complete a pre-assessment, uh, submitting either your resume or a LinkedIn profile. And one of the members of my team or myself would get back to you and talk a little bit about your candidacy. So we'll have a number of additional virtual events, on-campus events throughout the course of the year. We'll de definitely send you messages about those. So please uh, you know, feel free to reach out if you do have any questions, um, especially if we weren't able to cover them today. And I just wanted to take an opportunity to thank all of our faculty and our, our alums and students, everybody that has been here. Um, this was a fantastic webinar. I, I learned a lot myself. Um, and I have questions that I'm going to ask you at some point in the future. But thank you very much. And thank you all for attending. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. We're always happy to help. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thanks.